Christina. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for the Skyline College Science, Technology, and Health Learning Career Panel Discussion. Uh, we have two Skyline Learning communities in this area uh, or in this field, the Engineering and Technology Scholars and Biology and Chemistry Scholars programs. And we hope some of you, of you are out there uh, and joining us for this discussion. Uh, I wanna start off by introducing myself. I'm Brian Swartout. I'm the Program Services Coordinator for the STEM Center. Uh, program. Uh, we're a uh, on-campus resource designed to kind of engender a community uh, on campus and supporting the students uh, taking any of the relevant STEM courses, uh, looking to kind of uh, take part in careers or vocations that are involved uh, with the panelists that we have today. So we're really excited to give you guys an opportunity to speak with them. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let the panelists uh, introduce themselves uh, and then we'll get right into the questions. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and start the introductions uh, with uh, Brian. Hi, so my name is Brian. Uh, I'm a software engineer at a startup in San Francisco called Zigna Labs. Zigna Labs uh, helps companies protect their brand by tracking billions and billions of stories around the web and looking at all sorts of data to make sure that companies get ahead of things that might either help or hurt their brand. So we work with things like presidential candidates, big, big company like Google and YouTube and uh, airlines and uh, help analyze that data for them. And before I became a software engineer, I was actually working at Skyline College in the Career Services Center. And I made a transition about five years ago into the world of tech. Beautiful, thank you. And uh, a fun fact that you'd like to share about yourself. That was my fun fact, actually, oh. that I worked with. <laughs> my apologies. I'm sorry, it was one of the best facts. Well, next time. Uh, can we uh, continue with Joyce, please? Hi, everybody. My name is Joyce Martin. Um, I am a pharmacist by trade, um, but I actually work at Genentech. So Genentech is a pharmaceutical company. At Genentech, I'm the head of medical affairs compliance. Um, I have to say it's, it's a career path that even some of my pharmacist colleagues, you know, wonder how did I get into this field? So um, it's really an, an honor to be here with you guys to be able to show that really, you know, in the science field, there's many opportunities. Um, one fun fact about me is outside of my day job, I'm also a fitness instructor. I teach World of Dance UJAM at um, the various gyms here in the Bay Area. And right now during the COVID-19 situation, I'm actually teaching them virtually, which has been actually pretty great. Um, I have to say I was a little nervous at first, but it's been a great experience and a great way to create connections. Beautiful. Thank you, Joyce. Um, I'd like to go ahead and continue uh, with Jan. Let me go unmute myself. Hey, everyone. Um, Jan Milano. Um, I am a performance coach, um, basically working in the fitness field and um, handling in the realms of sports performance to our general population. I'm also a, um, a business owner. And I function and I facilitate my business in San Francisco for a few years now. And a fun fact about me, um, I don't know, I used to compete in ballroom dancing on top of that. So, hey. Beautiful, thank you, Jan. Um, and last but not least, um, let's uh, take it to Robin. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Robin Lopez, pronouns he, him, uh, his. Um, I've, I'm from the Bay Area, I've been here all my life, Richmond, California, uh, where I've been residing ever since I was born. Um, I started off in community college locally, went on to San Francisco State, uh, San Jose State for my master's, and currently UC Berkeley for my PhD. Um, professionally, I also work as a research scientist for the U.S. Department of Energy at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I've been there since 2012. Um, that started from an internship, which I could uh, digress more about later. Um, as well, um, beyond just the uh, scientific component, uh, much of my work also focuses on environmental racism, uh, addressing structural racism within academia, and um, how do we uplift representation um, with respect to accountability and um, 
making or holding a uh, broader space for those from uh, marginalized identities and spaces. Um, fun fact about me, I also do work as a freelance photographer. And during this pandemic, um, I've been having the luxury and privilege of being able to just look out on my deck and get pictures of different birds. Uh, apparently within these last several weeks, I became a birder and able to identify uh, several different birds in the neighborhood now. So if you catch me looking to the side like what I'm doing now, it's probably because I'm looking at this California blue jay that won't leave me alone, but I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, and so uh, before we move into the questions, I, I want to be sure to invite uh, all of you to join us uh, live on Wednesday, May 6th, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, to meet with all of the panelists uh, who will be available for questions to continue the career conversation from today's discussion. Uh, please note any questions you may have and share them with us on May 6th during the live event. Uh, and make sure to like the Skyline College Learning Community's Facebook page. Uh, we'll have a link uh, in the description uh, for more information on this career panel night's event uh, we'll be sharing in the coming weeks. Okay. And so let's go ahead and jump straight in to uh, our first question. Um, and the first question goes, when and how did you know you wanted this job or the field that we're currently working in? Okay. And if anyone would like to go first, uh, Joyce. Okay. Um, so I'll be honest. Um, I honestly didn't know I wanted to be in this field. Um, I think, you know, in high school, my strongest subjects have always been science and math. But as a high schooler, 18 year old, getting out of high school, I wanted to finish college fast, which I have to say was probably the biggest mistake <laughs> um, I made because I went into a career path that really I wasn't passionate about. And so, it, you know, on, it ended up wasting a year of my time. Um, but I think it also gave me the time to really start looking at you know, what am I interested in? You know, I knew I was interested in science, math, that field. Um, and I did some research and spoke with others that were working in the pharmaceutical industry, um, a friend of mine who was going through the pharmacy program. And I realized that, you know what, this is the path for me. You know, I do like healthcare. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not, I, don't have what it takes to be um, a physician or a nurse. I honestly don't have the stomach for it. <laughs> That's, you know, just being open and honest. Um, but I did really want to be in the healthcare industry. And so, um, you know, again, I didn't know. I think one of the things that I tell my son now, as he's a junior in high school, is really search, talk to people and you know kind of dabble in different things um, to see what it is that you do really like perfect thank you so much joyce um i'm going to go ahead and continue with um jan if we can please created as kinesiology um major that's where i got my degree at san francisco state actually and then really right at the end of my term, right at the end before graduating, um, I was actually, I've decided to uh, pursue a career in medicine. So I was aiming for the, um, I was aiming for med school at that time. And one of the classes, one of the last classes um, that I, uh, that, that was um, required for us was an internship. And City College was pretty nearby. You know, I wanted to, you know, I've always been an athlete. So I contacted the, the strength and conditioning coach there just for credits, just wanted to, you know, um, get my hours in. And long story short, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the mentor, John Bolano, he actually passed uh, about, I believe, a year now. Um, strength and conditioning coach for City College for about, I think, 17 years. Um, I worked with him under him for, I think, five or six years of that. Um, the greatest guy I've ever known. Um, a guy who would, you know, meet me at the college to mentor me for about four to five hours on Sunday afternoon. And he would just say, just uh, bring me burgers and beers and I'll teach you what I know. And I was like, a guy like that, I've just gotten inspired and uh, 
you know, never looked back since then. I've always wanted to pursue a, a career to follow his footsteps and having my business was a little bit of a different route, but it's kind of like the personality in me. But in terms of being a sports performance coach, uh, man, um, that has been the path. Perfect, thank you, Jan. Um, let's go ahead and continue with uh, Brian, please. You're in mute, there we go, thanks. Yep. Sorry, I think you muted me. Um, so yeah, so I kind of got into the software game a little bit late. I was like around 30 when I began learning to code and I was actually at Skyline College working in the Career Center and I was telling students to say, hey, you should really look into it. At the time there was a proliferation of these boot camps um, that say, hey, we have these like, you know, six month programs, we'll teach you to be a software engineer. And I kept telling students to say, hey, you should really look into this. And at that point I'd also made a big like life change. I stopped drinking and stuff. and I had a lot of free time on my hands. So I decided to like, I'm like, hey, maybe I'll teach myself to code a little bit. And so I picked it up and I'm like, oh, this is like the most fun I've had doing anything. This is awesome. This is like solving puzzles. And it was just way more interesting than I thought. I don't have like a background in computers or didn't really grow up with a computer. But I took to it. I really enjoyed it a lot. And, um, and that's kind of how I knew that like, oh, this could be like my career path. Like, maybe I could actually do this. So then I kind of just self-studied and like worked on projects till I kind of studied in myself into a, a job through some luck and through like some grit. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Robin? Yeah, so um, my path in finding and uh, determining what I want to do and um, knowing when I want to get into environmental science was a uh, a bit of a trial and error. Um, originally, I didn't have any intent on being an environmental scientist. I wanted to be a civil engineer. And that was only after I straightened my life out. Uh, very similar to what Brian had just mentioned. I didn't grow up with computers myself either. I didn't have internet access till I was like 18 years old. Um, so, I mean, it's not, that's a whole issue of digital equity that we could probably have a whole separate panel on that still exists. And, you know, tangentially, I just want to mention and acknowledge that we live in one of the richest regions of the world, yet we have the juxtaposition of wealth and poverty where, peop where young people in East San Jose still do not have access to internet or computers to do their work. And now that we're in uh, this current pandemic, um, I can't imagine how they're dealing with that. And I'm, you know, watching my nieces and nephews try to deal with this issue right now. But um, getting back to the point of the question, um, so I, I wanted to be a civil engineer. Um, and that was because when I was younger, uh, there was this uh, very vivid memory I had when my mother used to take me to drop my father off to work. And we'd always go across the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. And one day I remember asking her, like, how are we driving over water? Like, it just blew my mind away as a child. And she said, I don't know, ask the civil engineer. And I was like, what is that? She said, I don't know, you have to look it up yourself. And like I said, I didn't have internet back then, but we did have like the 1988 encyclopedia set. And so I went there and looked in the encyclopedia, like this sounds hella dope. And, you know, so I'm like, you know, third, uh, fourth grade thinking I want to be a civil engineer. And that's not uncommon. A lot of kids have big dreams, but then the nuances of life popped up and I got sidetracked from that a bit went back to community college at age 21 when I straightened up. And um, when I went to San Francisco State uh, for the engineering program, we have like a senior project. Mine's was to work with a team to build a steel bridge, a small steel bridge, only about uh, maybe six feet long. And we were to compete against other universities. And around this time, I was also thinking about different career moves. Uh, maybe not building bridges, maybe soil or water. And unfortunately with our bridge design, it completely collapsed. And I learned that if my name is ever on a bridge, don't go on it. And so that's what uh, inspired me to not go that route of civil engineering. Also, but as I got to that point, I realized I can't sit in front of computers all day and just crunch numbers. Um, when I know what the expected outcome may be. And that's why I love research science and environmental science much more. 
um, every day is a new challenge. Every day is a new complex problem that needs to be solved. And that's how I found myself where I'm at right now. Beautiful, thank you, Robin. Um, thank you so much for your, uh, your guys' responses to the first question. I wanna continue with the second one here, um, which is uh, how did your earlier career choices lead to uh, where you are now? Um, kind of piggybacking off of Robin's um, story here. Um, so uh, I'd like to kind of give him a chance to kind of come back to it and elaborate a little bit further before we uh, open it up to the rest of the panelists. Um, on. So yeah, this uh, it's a perfect segue, perfect transition. So you heard uh, what I just uh, explained earlier about having those those failures, and that's kind of that more or less has been the definition of how I've been able to uh, find my place where I'm at right now. And is those early career and early academic. Um, nuances of things that happen and don't happen, um, getting the scholarship that I, I was working really hard for or not getting the scholarship I was working really hard for, um, really helped me develop uh, critical writing skills that are very useful now in my ability to communicate science to um, my peers and colleagues, um, but also uh, internship. Internships are pivotal, they're, they're crucial for me um, when I was at Contra Costa College, we had uh, a STEM center, it's called Center for Science Excellence. And the director, Dr. Seti Siddhartha, one of my mentors, had encouraged me to apply for an internship with the US Department of Energy at the Berkeley Lab. And at that time, I was just like, you're, you're crazy. Like, they're not gonna take someone from Richmond, someone like me, you know, cause at that time I'd always go to school with like my gold teeth and I used to have like braided hair. I was a whole, I was a whole walking mess back then. And um, I applied anyway, um, partly because my mentors at the time who agreed to write letters of recommendation encouraged me to. And I felt if they believe in me, then I, I should believe in myself. And it was through that internship, uh, it's called a community college internship, and I could link that information to be shared later. Um, but it's through that internship that led to an additional internship that led to me being hired with the US Department of Energy that led to other people using their social capital to help me. And it, I know that sounds very straightforward, like a straight linear path, but it wasn't. But um, to put it concisely, that, that's how it happened. That's how I got where I'm at today. Okay. Yeah, um, thanks so much for, uh, for sharing that, Robin. Um, you mentioned internships. Um, I kind of want to like double down on that point for a second, uh, give opportunities to some of the other panelists to kind of speak on that because um, internships are really a, a, a great entryway into getting a, a career exploration uh, in the field. Um, and so I wanted to kind of open it up to other panelists who wanted to share a little bit about kind of internships and their oppor associated opportunities, uh, what's offered or what you can gain uh, from them. Um, and for this particular question, I was wondering if I could uh, uh, go with Jan first on this one. Yeah, that's, uh, that is definitely um, a big, big part of what we are here for. Um, I am actually, you know, proudly, proudly, I am proud to say that I am a B average student, uh, mainly because I actually, I, I know that I'm a visual learner. I have decided that I'm also, um, I'm a very, and you know, if you guys really do pay attention to your learning style, that's actually a really, really cool thing to figure out right now is uh, number one, I'm a visual learner and number two, I'm a very tactile person. I love uh, working with my hands and as a coach, I'm absolutely just like in drenched every day with just moving and grabbing and just, I'm a very physical, just um, I love moving the whole day. And again, it, it goes to say I can't sit down for a long time, but in terms of internships, um, you know, thinking back, from my journey, it is absolutely the most crucial part of why I got here today. Um, even though we are in the health and fitness, I am in the health and fitness um, or science field. And you know, my coach would always say, you can never be too scientific in this field because of course, you know, as a coach, as a performance coach, you gotta know your fundamentals on how the body works, your anatomy, physiology, 
and biomechanics. But um, at the end of the day, information is useless if you cannot tell it right to whoever you're teaching to. So the way to learn that is you cannot learn that in the classroom. You can only learn that by number one, watching several people how say it and that's how you kind of perceive okay you know that's a great way to say it and also figuring out how you say it um, and this is just you know encompassing what i do it goes in different molds or form in different industries as well but internships are the way to go in terms of developing and figuring out who you are and number two industries and, and this goes to every industry in my point of view is that you are nothing without the relationships built on the journey that you're on. Um, you know, it will never be a one man battle. It will always be, you know, actually, you know, from where I am now, every single job I've had since having my business was all connections based. Um, it was just a hookup from college. Even college was a hookup. It was like, okay, you know, I know this guy, I know this guy. And that's when you know your true self. If you are a good worker or if you're not, then maybe you need to improve on certain things because um, you'll never know unless you try is the basic fundamental key right there. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the wise words of advice, um, Jan. Um, let's go ahead and transition it over to Brian, um, who has his hand raised. I'll go ahead and unmute. Oh, thanks. So, yeah, I think what uh, Robert and Jan said is really important, especially about social capital and how internships are a way to like gain that because maybe you don't have connections to a certain industry or you don't, I mean, it's going to be so much easier once you establish that connection with a person to like find your way into like that kind of business. And I would say, especially like in the tech sector, like I see, I, I work with a lot of people that want to get into software development and obviously it's like a hot job in the Bay Area right now. And they always complain, like, oh, it's so hard to find that first job. It's so hard to find that first job. But the people I see really succeeding in it are the people that are doing internships. It's if you have the time and the like ability at a young age when you don't have necessarily like a job or a mortgage or kids or whatever that are going to prevent you from doing that, like I totally suggest it. It's a much easier path. And if to, and when you look at most of the students or people that get into big companies like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, like a ton of them start off from internships. I've noticed that's like the easiest path to go towards those um, those programs. So I would I would highly suggest doing internships. It just will make your life easier, I believe, in, the, in going forward. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, and then last but certainly certainly not least, uh, Joyce. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say you know, similar to Jan, um, I was definitely not the A student. I would even say I was probably more the BC student, um, especially in pharmacy school. Um, and, you know, it, it, when you're going through pharmacy school, when you're done, you have a choice. You have a choice of um, going out and working or you have a choice of doing another year or two of a residency program. Um, and I actually chose to do the residency program, which I think it, it's a little bit similar to an internship. Um, and I chose that. Um, and I think honestly, that was one of the biggest, you know, uh, career choices I made that has led to my success. You know, because again, like everybody's saying, these internships, residency programs, it's a way to network, have a mentor, um, because these are people that will advocate for you later on, right? These are the people who you can come to for advice um, and in, um, you know, discuss, you know, your career moves. They're there for you. Um, I know that for me, one of my biggest kryptonites, and I, and this is something that I tell my kids all the time, even when they were young, I could not find my voice. I doing even something like this right now, speaking as a panelist, you would never have seen me doing this. Um, and it honestly wasn't until after not even just pharmacy school, <laughs> but after my residency that I actually had the confidence to really find my voice. And it was really because of the mentor that I had. Um, you know, this person believed in me, believed in my capabilities, and gave me that confidence. And I think when you do these types of internships and programs, 
it, it really does build your confidence so that you can move on and go out there and do great things. Um, and again, I think in addition to these internships, all of us as panelists become your advocates. You know, we are, we're always here for you to reach out to and ask for advice. Um, so I, I highly recommend even reaching out to us. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Jan, see your hand raised. Would you like to uh, add a little bit to the comment? No, yeah, actually, I, I, I just thought, um, I know we talked about it a little earlier, Brian, appreciate the, the, the opportunity, but um, just wanted to mention, just to make sure uh, I do mention it now, I spill it out, is that from last year, um, I was able to uh, uh, accept applications and hire um, an intern. Uh, that I, that have stayed with me for about a year. And actually, even that her internship contract has ended. I loved her so much that I even offered her a paid internship outside of that. And I was like, you know, intern, I was never paid as an intern. And for me to even spill that out because it was, you know, it was such a great work. Um, and listening throughout this talk, I think it will be a great thing to kind of, you know, add a little ingredient into the thoughts of our listeners um if ever um you you're you're not just listening and jotting notes about what are the great things that are said but also being proactive as to planning as to how can you um how could you further uh what is the next step outside of this talk to make it really productive so thank you jan um so we're, he we're hearing a lot about, you know, advice on getting internships and kind of getting into the field. Um, one question that I want to pose as a mixed question of a couple of these on the list uh, is kind of now retroactively looking back at your journey to how you guys got to your job. Um, is there a career mess misstep that you would identify as one of your biggest lessons? Um, and kind of coupled with that, I think comes with like, is there any kind of risk large risk that you found yourself taking uh, as you kind of got involved with your respective careers. Um, so any kind of misstep for a lesson or any risks um, on your journey to your career path. Um, and I'd like to uh, first pose that question to uh, Brian, if we can. Sure. Yeah, so <laughs> I was laughing because I was thinking about all the missteps I've made throughout my whole life. Um, but in particular, I guess if I want to like narrow it down to like when I first became a software engineer, I was like freaked out. I thought everybody's gonna like figure me out and like, like that guy doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't. He shouldn't be here. So that made me really nervous about like speaking up or like you know taking on. I I pretty much thought I was gonna get fired like every day for the first two years. It was crazy. And it, there's a people I found I was like called imposter syndrome. And that was like, um, I wish I identified that earlier in my career and been more open and kind of exposed my ignorance because the more I'm now, I'm, I've, I've like graduated to a senior software engineer. And I, the more I speak, the more I kind of expose my own ignorance, it makes other people feel comfortable. And I know this is like a pervasive feeling in the industry, but also kind of it, 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 uh, it prevents you from really growing because if you're always afraid to make a mistake, then you're not gonna take on challenges and do new cool things, which is gonna really help you in the end grow. And I've never been laughed out of a room, you know, even after all these years and all the weird stuff I've asked and said. So that, that's been one mistake that uh, I've really focused on trying to, to not make. Speaking up more is so important. I was never really like, I was always a shy person. And I think I fake it really well now, but uh, it's definitely one of the best skills I think you can probably get as an individual, just putting yourself in positions where you don't feel comfortable. And um, one of the, uh, what the biggest uh, risk was actually just was, was switching careers. I was 30 years old. I had two kids and a third on the way. I, oh, no, it was two kids. And, you know, I mean, it was just kind of a gamble. You know, it's like, hey, are you really going to switch to a new career at some place? What if you do get fired in the first couple months and then you get back at zero again? It was a calculated risk, but it was one that I, kind of, you know, I decided I'm, I'm glad I took. And it kind of changed the trajectory of my career and my life so far. Beautiful. Thank you, Brian. Um... Let's see, uh, I'd like to continue this uh, with Joyce, if we can. Sure. So, you know, when I think back, um, so I've been at Genentech now for 20 years. Um, it's been a long run. Uh, when I first 
started at Genentech, you know, coming out of pharmacy school, my residency program, I actually was um, on faculty at a college of pharmacy as well and worked in clinical pharmacy um, at, at Stanford. When I went into industry, um, the group that I was with is, it's called medical communications. And for me, it was my sweet spot because my residency focus was on drug information. And so I had done that in academia, I've done it in the hospital. And so now transitioning into industry, it was a very natural transition. Um, I think some missteps that I've had, and when I look back at my 20 years at Genentech, um, similar to Brian, that, that imposter syndrome feeling, right? Um, I, I, there are times that I didn't feel like I was good enough. I knew I was good at the medical information piece of it. But even when my manager at the time would talk to me about becoming a manager, I would say, oh, no, 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 I, I'm not good enough for that. I can't. Um, and I really had to get over that um, because it was that fear. Um, it honestly was the fear of failing at something that I wasn't very familiar with. Um, and once I got over that, I, I started, again, building even more confidence. And then right earlier, I talked about just having the confidence to speak up, but now it was the confidence to do things that I wasn't, you know, trained in or an expert in um, and building that confidence. Um, when I finally was able to do that, I realized, gosh, I actually love being a people manager because it's like coaching. I love working with people. I love helping them grow. And that's how I see being a people manager. And so I think that, you know, because he asked me many times and I said no many times. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I look back and, and I think I shouldn't have said no. I should have been able to face my fears and, and just try it. Um, and I think, you know, um, the risk of trying something new, uh, I, I guarantee there's some great things at the other end of that. Thank you so much, Joyce. Uh, yeah, the imposter syndrome um, has become such a common reaction for most of us. I think uh, there was a piece of social media that I thought really helped myself through when I was dealing with it. Um, and it said, embrace your imposter syndrome. Just revel in the fact that you fooled everyone. Um, I just think, think it's a really nice rhetorical spin. I really appreciate uh, Brian and Joyce kind of bringing that to light. Um, Kind of want to touch base with Robin or Jan if, uh, if you guys would like to respond uh, to the question on, you know, missteps that turn into lessons or any kind of risks that you've identified in your journey uh, that brought you where you are today. Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll go first, uh, Robin. Um, but yeah, so no, there's uh, absolutely one. And it, it's it's uh, it's simmering in me until this day, and that is um, uh, basically when I was coaching at City College, I was coaching football, basketball, um, and track. Um, I was an assistant coach, obviously, but um, during that time, I was um, you know debating either you know it's about time, like I got to make a move, and my coach I've had you know heard of this. And just one day he came in and like, hey, man, I got you an opportunity to be part of the Stanford uh, sports performance team. And I was like, oh, oh uh, wow, that's crazy. You know, it was scary, you know, but it's it definitely I thought it was out of my league, but I got an application and I got got a really great um, letter of recommendation and eh, internship letter of recommendation. But um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. So. <clears throat> You know, going into Stanford, I, long story short, I got accepted um, and I was part of a contract uh, sports performance uh, gig at Stanford. I was like, oh, my God, this is awesome. Facilities were incredible. D1 athletes. It was just, you know, mind blowing. And, um, you know, I was going to be there for, you know, almost like a probationary period. Um, and, uh, you know, it was under my coach's recommendation, obviously, but when I was there, it was quite the different story in my head. Um, it was, you know, it was pretty insane. The biggest risk, number one, um, before the actual, uh, before the actual so-called mistake was the biggest risk was leaving what I had in San Francisco to transfer there to get paid little to none. 
um, because obviously the hopefully the rewards after that probationary period will be great. Um, I had to leave everything. I was already starting my business during that time, and I was already I had great athletes at City College. I had to leave everything. You know, just like what Brian said, it's a career change, um, or just it's you know different environment. But when I was there. You know, being a sports performance coach for a Division One college, it sounds sexy, but oftentimes it's not. I mean, we were there from either I would wake up from 4.30 a.m. I still had my own uh, apartment in San Francisco. I would literally wake up at 4.30 a.m., come home at like 11 and do that thing maybe for seven days a week. Sometimes we'll get called, um, you know, an athlete is coming in. You got to come in. There's, you know, you're owned by the teams, you're owned by the coach. All you got to do is say yes. So um, long story short, um, I got really down. I got really mentally drained. And I talked to my mentors. I talked to my friends. I'm like, bro, I, this is insane. I'm like burning every single ends of the candle, how many ends that has. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, I've decided to not finish my contract there and go back to my business, uh, continue my life here. Um, so in terms of the regret, I, I'm, I'm one person who doesn't believe in regrets in life because everything is just basically a lesson as long as you move on, um, as long as you learn from it. But that is just one thing that I wish I have finished my contract and maybe left but the fact that I didn't finish my contract because every contract is a promise, right? So I, when I, I was like, yo, you know, I, I was aiming for something. It didn't seem like it, you know, it's what I see and it just doesn't make sense for me to be here. Um, it made the re my reasons made sense to basically quote unquote quit. But at the end of the day, no one wants to quit. And sometimes you just got to grunt it out and maybe pull through and, you know, finishing something that you started gives, you know, a little bit more benefits. Um, a lot of my friends and mentors will say it was, it was, it was never a mistake. It was a great idea, but inside of me, that's still up to this date. Um, I wish I completed and maybe left. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm a man who keeps his promise and I felt like that day I didn't. So. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. Um, and then last but not least, Robin, um, any missteps as lessons uh, or biggest risks? Risks. Yes. Yeah, so um, to me, to be quite honest and uh, forward, um, my life has been nothing but risk. I mean, that that's the reality of growing up in the environment that I grew up in. I spent much of my youth between Oakland and Richmond. And it's constant. And Brian had alluded to this earlier: calculated risk. For someone in my position, for many people from our community, um, we're analyzing data extremely fast. We're analyzing whether or not we should step to the right, step to the left, um, talk to this person, not talk to this person, um, go down a particular street because there may be a cop there. You know. The whole, the, the list can go on and on. And so going into academia and going into my early career, um, this notion of this concept of risk seemed very minimal compared to the life that we have to live, um, if, if that makes sense. And it's not to downplay the significance or the trauma that does exist with risk that many people have to endure but it's it's again to highlight the reality that people from our communities from uh predominantly black and brown communities they've been dealing with with all their lives this is nothing new to us it you know excuse my language but it, it's shit we ain't never seen before i mean we're used to it and so for me if i did have to say there was a risk i would say my greatest risk was going into academia was going to college um because that puts a target on your back, uh, especially for people from our community. Um, some people take it the wrong way and think, oh, you, you think you're too good for us now. Um, I've been very privileged uh, and I, I will acknowledge that up and down uh, to, 
to the day I die. Like I've been very privileged with the people I've had in my circle because they didn't turn around on me. Um, but in that process, I've lost a lot of people. And so that kind of connects with the missteps, uh, that risk of going to academia. Um, in my mind, I thought I go to school, I, I do things right, I live a straight life. You know, we all eat, we're, we're all gonna be at the table. And it, it didn't work out like that. Like most of my childhood friends are now dead or they're in prison. And that's not to sound morbid or look for sympathy points, it's just to put the reality out there that, that that's what goes on. And that's what educators need to be cognizant of for students that they're dealing with who do come from these similar type of backgrounds and environments. Um, but also I had this misstep of thinking and assuming again that having an education would uh, bring me to this position where I could finally be acknowledged and respected for the intellect that I've always possessed, that our, our ancestors have always possessed thinking that if I get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a PhD, I would be taken more seriously. And again, that goes to Joyce and Brian's point about imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome exists because people don't take seriously um, individuals like ourselves who are people of color, um, despite holding advanced credentials, um, don't think that we have expertise and knowledge in what we speak about. Um, I, can go down countless times. I've stepped into meetings or gone to conferences and people look at me and they think I'm joking or uh, making stuff up about being a scientist or being in a PhD program at the, in the, one of the number one ranked programs in the world. And it's not that it bothers me or that it gets me angry. It's that it, I find it really deplorable that people still think like that, that we can't just accept people for who they are and for what they say they are, that we are constantly making people feel like they have to assimilate or move in these privileged spaces in a certain way. And for me, that was a big misstep. Um, I've, and I've learned to deal with that. And, um, I think Joyce uh, explained it perfectly in dealing with imposter syndrome. Um, you, you learn to move and uh, take the punches as they go. And then sometimes you learn how to punch right back. Uh, it's, it's all about picking and choosing your battles. Perfect. Thank you so much, Robin, uh, for sharing. Um, at this point, I kind of want to transition more specifically to questions regarding your fields. Um, and so what I really want to start off with um, is just kind of now that you guys are uh, involved, uh, what do you guys do to stay current uh, with the field that you guys are working in? Um, and for this question, I'd like to kind of uh, start it off with um, Jan, if we can. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, you know, the field of human performance. Um, number one, I think every, uh, every coach or trainer should always be accustomed to uh, maybe uh, getting themselves involved with getting the new um, latest research if they can, you know, either however way they can get that because our, our, our field is um, not necessarily always evolving, but there's new um, data coming out um, constantly. So being apt to uh, just stay in tune with that, there's several resources for that. Um, so that's what one thing that I constantly do every week and what I actually do constantly um, in my schedule is plug that in into a little bit of like an education hour every Friday afternoon. I can say it now is like at 3 p.m. And that is my time to, because if I don't schedule it, I'm, I ain't going to do it. Um, just to kind of read some articles. And then again, <clears throat> I'm, I, I, I'm actually, I work best and I learn best from conversations more than just reading this and I know all about it. But, uh, you know, in college, I, I, you know, I would read the textbooks and whatnot, but I actually... I love the, you know, the, the study groups that we have at San Francisco State at that ghetto tent um, library that we, we had. You know, there's countless um, hours spent there talking about the material. And I was like, that's actually where I thrive the most. So another thing that I do, um, I've been in the industry for uh, about maybe 12, 13 years now. And I've met great coaches all over the world through conferences and whatnot. And especially this time even 
it happened more and more and you know just checking up on my buddies from london and whatnot like you know you guys good over there what are you guys doing with your athletes and what we do constantly is actually just do facetime zoom whatever it may be and just have conversations because you know number one again when when we read these research articles just to be you know just to make sure that we you know we're sharpening our irons in, in the field in the human performance field but other than that that information can be applied in several different ways and i basically stay tuned with that with what my buddies in london and china are doing and several coaches actually american coaches get transferred everywhere so i really just have a conversation with them and uh uh, learn and also discuss you know it's almost like a, a constant podcast happening but just not recorded so it's it's personally what i do perfect thank you jan um let's see can we go ahead and continue um if anyone else would like to share joyce brian robin uh yes i could so i could share how uh, i work to stay uh, current and up to date with relevant uh, information. So this is very hand in hand with what Jan was saying. It's all about um, communication and sharing of knowledge. And when you get back, when you get down to the nitty gritty thing of it all, that's what science is. It's constant sharing of knowledge, but also um, that got to be coupled with constantly asking questions. So earlier I'd mentioned, um, you know, being curious and you know, that that's what science is all about, it, you know, and that's why I feel everyone is a scientist. Uh, if you're curious and you're creative and you're trying to use that curiosity and creativity to solve problems, that's you implementing the scientific method. Um, we have, so we have what we, uh, it's called credential scientists, those who have degrees and non-credential scientists, those without degrees, but probably know way more than us with degrees. And so I mentioned that because that's also how I work to stay relevant and, not, and knowledgeable is by constantly consulting with those who aren't in academia, aren't in science, scientific enterprise, who are actually in the trenches, who are dealing with this, uh, the severe impact of climate change, for instance. And so I'm constantly out in, uh, in, in the community doing outreach, you know, getting in, information and feedback, working with trying to work with local indigenous population to understand not just what their needs are, but how did their ancestors protect the land and how can we better protect the land um, with the resources and knowledge that we now have. Um, or, in, or in many cases, it's not uh, a matter of us better protecting the land, it's just a matter of us listening to indigenous people um, so that we can improve where we've been lacking. Um, so I, I would say that that's the biggest piece. And then of course, it's reading the literature and staying up to date and constantly, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm gonna reiterate, constantly asking questions. You run out of answers if you run out of questions. So the more questions you, answer, you, you put on the table, the more solutions you're, to, you're gonna come up with. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Joyce, would you like to share with us? Yeah, so I, I love what you just said, Robin. Um, there's something that you said that really stood out to me, and that's to be curious. Um, it's something, you know, I, 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 my team, I have a team of 30 people, and myself and the managers that report to me that also have their direct reports, that's one of the biggest things we tell everybody is to stay curious ask questions. Um, because again, similar to, to Jan and Robin, that's how I like to stay current. Um, you know, so my, my current job now is I head up a compliance organization. Well, the compliance world shifts and it can shift pretty quickly. And, you know, one of the things that I've always told my team is we always have to stay current. 
um, you know, with our, our field, because what will happen is if we don't, our job will outgrow us because we haven't kept up. And one of the biggest ways that we can keep up is to be curious, ask questions and don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, you know, absolutely similar to, to Jan and Robin reading articles to stay up on, you know, what's happening in the industry, especially as it relates to compliance in the pharmaceutical world. Um, I can tell you one of the tricks of the trade for us in the pharmaceutical world is you go to the FDA's website, the Food and Drug Administration, and you see what warning letters they've given other people. <laughs> and you learn from what they've done and you look at what you do to see how you can do things better. And, and honestly, that's how we keep up. Um, but it, it really does take each of us asking questions, being brave enough to ask questions. There's no dumb questions. That's what I always tell everybody. There are no dumb questions, right? We have to be able to ask questions, be curious and learn. Um, and when we keep that growth mindset, that's how we constantly stay, you know, in tune with what's happening in each of our areas and how we continue to grow. Perfect. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Moving on, let's go ahead and uh, continue with just kind of like in that notion of curiosity. Um, the students who's going to be watching this video, they're going to be curious on what steps uh, you took to effectively prepare yourself uh, to kind of take on the field uh, that we're involved in. And so, um, you know, what are so, uh, this is one of my favorite questions on like, if you were to give advice to yourself like back then, what would you tell yourself? Uh, I guess, what is that piece of advice? And I'd like to start this off with uh, Brian, if we can, please. Yeah, sure. Piece of advice I'd give to my younger self regarding my career. Um, that, that's, a, that's a tough one. I think uh, I probably, I mean, I probably would have wanted to get into it much earlier. Uh, one thing, I wish I had been kind of exposed to that career earlier and even known that it was even a viable kind of opportunity to do. Um, but the one, I also teach a lot of classes on this too. So I teach like coding classes. I'm talking to like between adults and students. And one thing, one piece of advice I do give to people is to break out of the software engineering is the interesting uh, skill. And it's kind of like a cross section between like, uh, you know, uh, art kind of, cause it's a lot of like creative thinking and creative problem solving. And the only way you can really learn it is by actually doing. So I think people get so wrapped up in, they have a 10 textbooks and they bought 20 courses online and they're doing and they didn't take the time to actually just do the work. Like actually just, there's no, there's no uh, substitute for actually just getting there and doing the work. And I think that's a lot, a lot of industries. And I think that kind of also ties back into internships. Getting hands-on experience is the number one, uh, uh, it's, it's the most beneficial thing you can do with your time. So I think that, you know, Applied studying is really helpful. And of course, theory is also really useful. But I think in a lot of industries that it's like actually doing the work is going to be so much more valuable. And I wish I had done more of that earlier because I think it would have uh, made me progress even faster. Thank you, Brian. Um, let's see. Uh, anyone else would like to share for this question any advice that you would either give to a past self or a student? Um, Robin? Yeah, so um, path advice, and this goes hand in hand with what I just shared um, and what I shared also on a different panel uh, with the organization called SACNAS. We had an insight to success panel for community college students. And this similar question that came up, what would we tell students who are trying to be successful? And part of that answer is, again, being curious and being creative but also um, as one of the panelists from the other panel I was on mentioned, Diamond Tashira, who's at University of Hawaii at Manoa, had mentioned, you need to find those, those quote unquote cool professors. You need to find those advocates and those allies who will use their social capital for you um, to benefit you and to leverage uh, for better opportunities. And the best way to find those people, because sometimes they're not that easily identifiable when you just sit in a lecture and hear them talk about um, you know, Newton three laws, um, which I probably can't remember off the top of my head right now, other than two things colliding. Um, but one of the best ways to identify those professors or faculty, staff on campus is 
by joining community organizations and clubs on campus. Because usually those clubs and campus, those clubs on the campus have to have a faculty advisor. And if you're joining an organization that's pretty dope and stands for a good cause that aligns with your moral values, chances are the faculty sponsor also has those shared values. And that's not that cool mentor you're looking for. And that's the person you want to network with and connect with and see how they could help you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, let's continue with uh, Jan. I saw your hand up next. No, yeah, I think um, the burning desire to say this for me, and this is what I absolutely emphasize with my interns and uh, the students I teach now. Um, and even what we go through, I'm actually currently uh, in grad school as well, getting my master's um, in exercise science. But, and this is actually where I am doing my um, thesis on, um, and that is to a younger Jan, you know, in my, in my early careers, I think nothing beats uh, my list than uh, relationships, um, building relationships, and also just, you know, uh, in layman's term, you, you've had, you gotta be a cool dude. You gotta be a cool dudette. You know, it's, it's one thing, it's one thing to, I wanted to emphasize for myself and, uh, you know, this is what I, I truly missed, messed up on, on, on a couple of occasions. Um, and that is, uh, number one, you gotta have a great relationship and it should be a goal. It encompasses who you are as a person, but you gotta have great relationships with number one in, in the workplace with yourself um, and you know with your mentors and whatnot there's there's no success into uh, you know saying hey Jen's not really a cool dude you know is it's, it's hard to move forward when there's a lot of resistance with that so I think you know who wants to work with that person when that is a negative energy in the office or in the facility I won't hire that person so I think that's a really key, key thing. And as, as secondly, outside of really, or, you know, on top of relationships is relationship with your job, right? Whatever you're doing, whatever field that is. And in my early careers where whatever, you know, environment I was in, either city college or working as a physical therapy aide or whatnot, um, you know, being blinded by it probably before, but looking back on it now, um, I think the emphasis of whatever you're doing, you got to have a good relationship with it or doing a great job with it. You may not like it, but you got to embrace it because you won't necessarily do everything that you, you like to do. You don't get to do that when you're young, but it will lead you to a good place. But no one's going to write you a letter of recommendation. No one's going to promote you if you're just that negative energy. So I think, number one, the, again, we're building relationships in order for you uh, that actually is almost like fuel to your engine. It just propels you forward. People will root for you if you are that person. And with you loving what you do and loving your career, loving almost um, whatever the task may be and whatever the job may be, will all, will give you another positive energy moving forward rather than direct you to you know another negative thing that. I think sometimes it's just a ripple effect. You're just in this whirlwind of negative thoughts. And um, at the end of the day, the, the word relationships means a lot to me because, you know, when you're uh, at the end of the day, when you're old and whatnot, really what you're, you're probably going to think about, you're probably not going to think about everything that have happened in terms of jobs, but you're probably going to think about all the great people that you have made great relationships with along the way. And that's a great thought that I always keep in mind. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Um, could we, uh, Joyce, uh, would you like to share? Yeah, so I 100% agree with what everybody has said, um, you know, because I, I, those are the things I truly believe in. I think the, the one thing that I would 
also like to add, if I had to tell my younger self something, it's to find my voice early. And I know I mentioned that earlier. Um, and when I say early, I mean, this is why even for my kids, when they were young, I always pushed them to, you know what, you want something from the counter, why don't you go up and ask for it? Um, <laughs> instead of having mom and dad ask for it. And it's so key, because I will tell you, I didn't feel comfortable truly just raising my hand to ask a question until, I kid you not, until I was almost 30. And I think that's way too long to wait because as you build relationships, as you have this curiosity that you wanna learn more, you have to be comfortable asking a question and speaking up. Um, because if you don't, you can, you can be curious about a lot of things, but it'll hold you back from actually asking the question. And I, when I think back to even when I was in pharmacy school, I was the one who sat in the back of the class, tried to hide. So when the professor's looking around to see who they're gonna ask a question, I'm ducking so they don't ask me one because I didn't wanna you know, um, say anything. I didn't want to speak up. And that's just, it's way too late. Um, it, it's not impossible, but I think back to all the opportunities that I could have had that I didn't. And so that that's the one thing I would just add is, you know, really find your voice early and be confident in asking and speaking up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. So, Wow, uh, the time flew by. Uh, we're almost at the uh, top of the hour again. And so I wanted to do uh, one kind of last check-in uh, in light of the current circumstances. Um, but I'd also like to weave in one quick question uh, with it as well. Um, the question I'm weaving in is uh, the misconceptions uh, that folks outside of your sector uh, have about your jobs that you would would like to have the opportunity to debunk with our students here. Uh, and then also the closing question that I have is just in, in light of the COVID-19 uh, and the shelter in place policy that's continuing through the end of May uh, for the Bay Area Peninsula. Um, we wanna ask how has the shelter in place order changed uh, how you work uh, the working from home, are you identified as an essential worker? Are you working and homeschooling simultaneously? Uh, what are some new things, new developments uh, that you've had in this current circumstance? Uh, and I'd like to start uh, this question off with uh, Robin, if we can, please. So um, misconceptions about uh, science in general and particularly those in environmental science, because many of us, uh, at the end of the day, our work will find a way to intersect with uh, issues of climate change. There's no dancing around that. That is the reality of the world we live in. Um, and that, uh, that leads to this issue of misconceptions that people have, that uh, we as scientists are um, trying to push out an agenda, are uh, feeding uh, the media, uh, a narrative that's not true to line our pockets. And the truth is most scientists don't get paid that well, especially in research science. Um, there is no agenda um, for most of us, um, but those misconceptions are very valid. And I'm not here to invalidate anyone's experiences or anyone's um, beliefs because science itself is uh, built off the structures of racism. Um, even as recently uh, as uh, examples of the Tuskegee Project. Um, we, there, there's countless examples of how science has been used to uh, perpetuate racism, white supremacist ideology. And so um, I had mentioned in the very beginning of this that a lot of my work also focuses on environmental racism. That's more than just looking at uh, redlining and uh, keeping people of color out of green spaces. That's also trying to reconcile and acknowledge what science has done to people of color, what science has done to women, how science has been used in these uh, in a capitalistic world to control women's bodies to produce labor, um, meaning issues of um, trying to force women to continue producing um, children. 
So, you know, the list can go, go on and on. And that, that's a whole completely different uh, side conversation that needs to be had. But um, I, I will acknowledge that it could be perceived as a misconception, but at the same time, it's not. These are the realities that we live in. This is what uh, people in the past in the sciences have allowed and many have been complicit with. And we're finally just starting to get to the surface of acknowledging that. Um, in terms of what I've been doing during this uh, pandemic and shelter in place, um, it's been very odd for me because I'm used to constantly being on the go and doing things and interacting with people. I'm, I'm a social butterfly through and through. Like I'm, I'm, I'm the co-chair for uh, social activities for my department at UC Berkeley. And so it's been really frustrating not to be able to do anything right now. Um, but as a consequence of the shelter in place and pandemic, um, my work is completely on pause right now. Um, I did have a call earlier today with one of my PhD advisors. We're trying to see if we can get an exception to do summer field work because we do anticipate shelter in place still being in effect in the summer. Um, and it, it's very critical that we uh, get the data for our field site. And it's not that I'm saying we need to prioritize science over lives, but um, getting this data can help us understand um, critical annual uh, patterns that are impacting the survival of uh, fish and other species uh, in California watershed system. Um, but on a positive note, uh, during this pandemic, I've made a very good use of my time and I messed around and applied to be an astronaut for NASA. Any callbacks? Not yet. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm hoping to shoot to the moon for this one. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to continue this uh, with uh, checking in with Joyce. Sure. So, um, wow. How, how do I follow that? Man, that's great. I, I hope you get that back to be an astronaut. I think you'd be amazing doing something like that. Um, I think, you know, so I, I mentioned that my, my current job is heading up a compliance organization. Uh, I think the, the misconception that people have about compliance is one, we're the police in the company to tell you what not to do. Um, and two, we're, we're boring. Um, so I can tell you, I, I hope people would say I'm neither of the two. <laughs> um, I think within our organization, even from day one, when I started our, uh, the compliance group, I wanted to demystify that conception of being the police. Um, I consider us as business partners. We're in the business. We understand the business. We're here to help the business and help the business do things the right way. Um, and I think within um, the organization that I'm in, which is medical affairs, I think, you know, we've been able to establish that, you know, we've been around for, uh, my group has been around for 10 years. That's when we first started the group. And I think we've, you know, through that time, um, have established ourselves as business partners who are here to help. And I, I feel like that's true because we get hit with a lot of questions early on when someone has an idea of something they they reach out and to me I feel like if we were really the police they would just do something and and tell us later which or have us catch them later which doesn't happen so um, I, I think our organization knows that we're really business partners um, but the other thing is you know I think they think we're kind of stuffy boring um, I think that you know, I, I, I think I demystified that when people found out that I was a fitness instructor. Um, and at one of our big meetings, I actually did a class and some people came and somebody actually said, wow, you're, you're not really scary. I'm like, of course I'm not scary. <laughs> um, but also um, kind of tying into the COVID-19 situation, um, I, I still work, um, but I work completely from home now. Um, my, my day job has seemed to gotten, to, to have gotten busier since we've been working from home because I think people feel that it's easy to put meetings on calendar back to back um, without a break. So it, it gets tough sometimes. But one of the things, you know, again, I, I'm all about leading by example. And um, 
you know, the, being in the shelter in place, it, it's tough for me. I like to be around people. Um, but I think that being on these types of video conference calls, I feel like we've been able to make more connections. I've gotten to know people more because I can see into their homes. Um, I highly recommend everybody turn on their cameras because again, I, I'm a people person. I like to see faces. Um, and so I, I do that as well. Um, but one of the things, again, to demystify the fact that people think that compliance people are boring, um, I actually yesterday had a compliance meeting with multiple compliance functions across our entire organization. So we had over 100 people. And during the shelter in place, one of the things that I tell my folks, my team, is they need to get up, you know, away from their, their laptop, from the seat that they're sitting in, go outside and get some fresh air. Their backyard, their front yard, whatever it is. I even schedule my one-on-ones with them as walk and chat so they can go outside. Um, but to set the example, I took this meeting from my backyard yesterday because it was a beautiful day. I sat in the backyard um, to set the example because again, it's something that I tell my team and I'm all about, you know, leading by example. So again, I did that and hopefully it showed others, you know, other groups that may feel that they have the same misconceptions about themselves that we're not all this way. You, you can loosen up a little bit and, and show that we are real people. <laughs> we're not the police. We're friendly and we're here to help. So, um, but that's kind of been my shelter in place. I have two kids, so, but they're older. I have a 17 year old and a 13 year old, so they can self manage themselves. Um, so it makes it a little easier for me. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's tough because I like to be with people. I like to teach my fitness classes in person, but you know, again, those have all gone virtual. Um, but again, I think there's still ways to make connections, even though we're in our homes. Thank you so much, Joyce. Um, I'd like to continue uh, checking in with Brian. Uh, the, how has COVID-19 affected uh, your work? Uh, also, any mentions of any misconceptions that you'd like to debunk at this point? Yeah, you know, software engineers, I think, fit a lot of weird stereotypes. And I gotta, I gotta say, you know, people might think compliance people are boring, but software engineers actually are kind of boring. Um, that was fun. you go to like on my, my team, it's like, you have the sales guys on one side, but they're always having a lot of fun. You go to the software engineering side, it's, you could hear a pin drop, but, but I will say this, I think two of the big misconceptions about software engineers is first that our job is like all memorization that we just like memorize a bunch of like, we're essentially typists and that is completely untrue. It's mostly lots of just creative problem solving is what we end up doing. And um, even though I'm kind of joking about, you know, the stereotypical software engineer kind of being the neck beard guy you might see in like a video game, like a chat room or something like that. I mean, the reality is that this is not a lone wolf type of job. This is a job that requires lots of interaction. And I think people either they want to go in there because they say, I don't like working with people. I'm like, well, this is not the job you want then. Because like we have, I have a distributed team I'm working on with guys from different countries. Um, we constantly work together. We're, we're reviewing each other's code. We're talking. We have to, you know, and when you're reviewing code, uh, it can be emotional, personal. So you have, you want to, you know, be polite, respectful, and you're working with people across departments all the time. Some guy from sales say, hey, this thing is broken. Why is this broken? And you need to explain it in a way that he can digest or she can digest and understand and then talk to somebody else. So it's a job that does require a lot of working with people, um, which I think that people either forget or they or they just uh, don't, don't view as part of this uh, job. Um, COVID-19 thing has definitely affected me a lot. I mean, personally, you know, like everybody else in home, I have three kids. It's, it's, it's tough just to have the mental focus and concentration to do your work. As a software engineer, you go to work and most of the people have their headphones on, kind of like a little polite symbol saying, hey, I'm working, you know, maybe don't bother me unless it's really important. And obviously at home, that boundary is completely broken because there's no privacy at all with your children running around. They don't care if you're in the middle of some critical issue that you're trying to figure out. They're just like, hey, what? I need a waffle or something like that. Um, so that's been the most difficult part. But luckily as a software engineer and having a big distributed team, we work remote so often that we're most of us are pretty used to this anyway. So it wasn't a huge transition, but just, we're, just dealing with family 
is, is difficult. Um, and I think a lot of companies don't really take that into account that like, you're just not as productive during this time. At least I'm not. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been an experience, it's been an interesting experience. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and last but not least, Jan, um, how has life All with right. COVID-19 and misconceptions? Things have been good, man. But in terms of, but in terms of what was that? The, what was the first one? The misconceptions. That's yes. funny, man. I mean, I mean, my parents still think I'm a Zumba instructor up to this day. Not going to lie. I mean, there's, there's so much, yeah, just, they don't believe it. They don't know what the hell I do. Um, but you know, they're also not interested as long as I'm doing well. Uh, that's, that's practically what they care about. But, um, in terms of personal training out there, misconceptions is right next to it. There are so much things, you know, um, that's why I even don't, I, I don't even in my business, in my everything, in my cards, there's no such thing as personal training in there because I, I actually try personally to stray away from the connotation that ties into that because they believe in the word coach more than trainer. Um, you know, with the, tr with the word trainer, a lot of people just say, oh my God, you know, you just make people sweat or, um, oh, you know, how many people have gotten injured, you know, under, because people rightfully so though, rightfully so they have every single, um, right to say that because there are a lot of trainers out there, you know, I don't mean to bag and talk negatively, but a lot of people just take it very not seriously. And it's, it's almost like a stepping stone. They're a trainer and a bartender at the same time and then doing other things. They're not really that focused on it. But in terms of debunking that uh, misconception, I mean, for myself, it's my mission. This is something that I wake up for every single day. And, you know, in terms of debunking that, at the end of the day, I don't really need to. My population speaks for itself. Uh, you know, if my population is thriving at the end of the day, I'm doing a great job. Um, so with, you know, with, um, yeah, you know, the, the, the number one thing I keep in mind, I have this in my locker. I have this ba basically, of, it's what I've followed throughout my career is that every coach or trainer can make you sweaty and tired, but not every coach or trainer can make you better. And which one are you? Um, you know, I can make you do a thousand burpees. You'll get out, you lose weight. Um, you'll get sweaty, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you really got better after that session. So, um, yeah, I mean, those misconceptions is absolutely there. It's just a matter of staying true to, you know, yourself, um, it, with this COVID thing, it actually ties into those misconceptions. I have a lot of colleagues. I have a lot of trainers who, when the lockdown happens, um, they don't, they're, they're, they're scouring for business. They're scouring for, for clients because, um, you know, where are your clients? But in terms of really on the flip side of that, you know, coaching is in the industry of customer service, number one, and coaching is in the industry of people care. Um, we have the knowledge, we have the expertise, and we have um, the experience of hopefully manipulating your recovery, your exercise, hopefully advising you in your sleep. Um, we're not nutritionists, although we can create some um, habitual changes in there. You know, I personally, um, I lost, you know, Zoom adds 10 pounds, it seems like looking at myself right now. But over my years, actually, in about a year in senior year of college, I was 265 pounds. Um, and in about a year, I lost that to 165. And just, you know, uh, kind of bounced 20 pounds outside of that. Um, but in terms of, you know, uh, this COVID thing, at the end of the day, when the lockdown happens, uh, in, in the entirety of a coach, if the client's and athletes see the value in what you do. That is um, basically your debunking of misconception in there. They could say whatever they want, but um, you know, with that being said, for me, um, I'm actually in, I, I shouldn't say it. There is a pandemic, but I don't mind. I'm, I'm realizing I'm a little bit of homebody. Um, I have a great garage gym that I have trans uh, uh, transformed into just an office where I. Um, 
uh, coach. I, I'm still able to coach about 25 or 20 to 25 sessions a week, which is a great amount, uh, but normal actually, I'm about 40 sessions a week. Um, and I'm still in constant communication with my athletes and those people who I take care of who are not doing virtual, I'm in constant communication with them. Um, so it gives me joy that I'm still in the customer service industry and it gives me joy that I'm still taking care of people. Um, in the midst of the pandemic, I think uh, my dogs are really happy to have me around every single day, every single morning. Um, and my girlfriend is an, uh, a nurse, so you know I applaud her and take care of her every day as I salute her for what she does. Um, but yeah, I think we're all just hanging in there, but staying positive as much as we can. All right. Thank you, Jan, uh, for your comments. Um, uh, just out of respect for all of our own uh, personal time, uh, I really want to take a moment to thank you all again uh, for being with us. Um, you could have been anywhere else, uh, but you guys all chose to be in this uh, Zoom call with us um, and sharing some of your wisdom and your insight with the students. And I'm sure that the students will be very appreciative once they get a chance to view this um, when we upload it. Uh, but we also want to advertise uh, the opportunity on uh, Wednesday, May 6th, 7 p.m. We're going to be hosting another live session. Um, we'll, we'll be inviting all the panelists back and hopefully uh, students, you guys will get a chance to con uh, connect uh, with uh, these panelists and many, many more uh, with the other um, learning community events. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you guys all uh, deeply um, and sincerely for taking the time uh, to speak with us today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and end the call. Uh, and again, thank you so much. Have a good one, guys.